climbed a mountain And I picked wildflowers and put them in her hair And at the top we found a meadow and danced barefoot in the grass And I'm not lying, there were bluebirds in the air It was a long one And there's a time or two we felt like giving up But every fall and every stumble made us stop and see the wonder With your hand in mine we pushed on towards the top Hey everybody, I'm Polly G. Welcome back to the Polly G Show. Coming to you live from Mount Washington. One of my favorite places in all the world. So one of my favorite pastimes is to be outdoors. I'm a, a lover of uh, the great outdoors and I do a lot of hiking and climbing and things like that. And one of my favorite places to be in all the world are the beautiful White Mountains of New Hampshire. So, uh, I've summited Mount Washington about 12 times. I'm not gonna summit today because I'm just getting through some uh, orthopedic surgery. Uh, it's quite windy up here, as you can you can probably hear. But uh, anyway, let's uh, go on a little journey around uh, the White Mountains of New Hampshire with me. Come on along. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, so as I said at the top of the video, uh, one of my favorite things to do in my free time is to uh, spend a lot of time outdoors. Uh, I do a lot of hiking and things of that nature. Uh, and one of my favorite places to spend time is up here in the beautiful White Mountain uh, National Forest. Uh, here in uh, central New Hampshire. Uh, it's a beautiful place to be, and uh, I spent a lot of time up here. I've been coming up here for probably about uh, 25 years now or so, and uh, it's just, of all the places I've been around the world, this is really one of my favorites, you know, to be. So, uh, now the, the mountain ranges are, are pretty vast, and uh, the tallest peak is Mount Washington, the tallest peak in this mountain range is Mount Washington and I think it's 6,300 feet something like that so not one of the biggest mountains in the world but certainly the biggest in the Northeast uh, I have summited the mountain I think about 12 times now or so uh, I'm not gonna do it this year uh, I'm just uh, you know had some orthopedic surgeries uh, late last year and into this year so not quite in good enough shape yet need to lose a few pounds and you know train a little harder but uh, I am doing some uh, some climbing I made it up uh, a couple of days ago up to the top of a location called Tuckerman's Ravine I'll show you some images from that it's a beautiful place to uh, to get to that was a pretty significant climb all in itself so kind of feeling the pain from that today uh, but you know in order to really summit Mount Washington I, I really have to train for several months uh, because it's a pretty rigorous climb uh, to do so it's not something I recommend people do take lightheartedly uh, you know it's a beautiful place but it's also it can be very dangerous if you're not careful and you don't really prepare for that so uh, I think what I'll do too is later in the video maybe I'll get into some of the things that I do to prepare and bring along with me if I am going to summit and I do plan to do it again uh, I think in 2025, I'll be in good enough shape to do it. Uh, 2024 is out. The window to do it really is between like early June to, I'd say, no later than the end of August. Uh, after that or before that, there's a high risk of snow and ice and things. And the weather can get really, really crazy. Even in the summer, it, it can get pretty insane. I've seen it range from... When I left the base, you know, 65, 70 degrees and get up top and it's 10 degrees and snowing. And uh, so it can get pretty crazy really fast. So you really have to be prepared. It's no joke, uh, but it is really exciting and really a lot of fun. So 
so I love coming up here and just relaxing. Uh, it's just a whole different, you know, mindset for me when I'm here. There's all kinds of wildlife around. Just this morning I saw, I don't know, countless turkeys and deer and uh, some other things. Uh, I haven't seen a moose yet this year. I have seen them before. Uh, there's a lot of moose up here. Uh, so uh, the fact that I haven't seen one yet, it doesn't mean they're not here. There's plenty of them around. Just didn't cross my path. So uh, they're actually kind of dangerous too. So you don't want to get too close if you do see a moose. Don't don't sneak up on it and try to get a selfie with it or something. I, I don't recommend that at all, you know. So, uh, But it's a beautiful place, and I want to just take you around, show you some of the sites. Uh, I'll probably interject some photos from previous uh, summit uh, successes that I've had uh, and then just show you, you know, around town a little bit. It's, there's some fantastic little little towns nearby so it's a wonderful place to be if you ever have an opportunity to get up to uh you know new hampshire and specifically uh the white mountains and the lakes are pretty special too up here uh but i love the mountains more than anything so uh yeah i highly recommend you do that so let's uh let's have a look around i'll show you some of the things that i've seen on the trip and maybe some previous trips and uh here we go all right, so here we are at the Pinkham Notch Visitor Center, part of the Appalachian Mountain Club. And this is all part of the White Mountain National Forest, which surrounds us here. And uh, this is my launch pad normally from when I climb the mountain. Uh, this is uh, Mount Washington here. You can't see the peak here because it's uh, further back behind these bluffs that are in front of us here. Uh, but in the center of the shot, you'll see... Uh, Tuckerman's Ravine, that's uh, normally the path that I take up to the summit, uh, which is way uh, far beyond that point. So a lot of skiing goes on there too in the wintertime, but uh, this is where I start out normally. Beautiful, beautiful place. This will just give you some slight idea of what the trail looks like. Uh, this is really the easiest part of the trail. This is uh, pretty close to the base. It gets significantly more aggressive and then once you get past the tree lines, it's pretty much just one big rock pile. All along the way, you'll find these beautiful fresh spring waterfalls. This is all from the melted snow from the winter, coming off hundreds of waterfalls that surround the mountain. And this water is so clean and pure, you could just drink it right out of the waterfall and it would be the best, cleanest, freshest tasting water you've ever had in your life I promise you and angles picking up a little bit trails getting a little more aggressive a little harder to climb but still nothing compared to what it's like near the summit and here's just some more beautiful waterfalls you run into these here and there along the trails and they're really special great places to fill up your water bottle and uh, enjoy some really really fresh spring water all right, so here we are. This is probably about the halfway point to the summit, but again, this is about as far as I'm going to go today. You can't see the summit here. It's it's uh, it's behind these ledges that we're seeing here. That's Tuckerman's Ravine. It's a beautiful place here today. And then all along the way, there's these beautiful little ponds and fresh springs. You can get really, really fresh, clean water. So uh, really just a very special place. So fun place to be today. Today we're heading out to uh, another one of my favorite places here, which is the Lost Pond. It's a beautiful place to hike to. Less aggressive hike today. It's a very rainy day. So hey, just a little tidbit. Uh, if you're ever doing any hiking and you get lost, you don't know where you are, you need to understand your sense of direction. Just look for the rocks or trees with the moss growing on them, and that moss is facing north. So that's your due, due north point right there. Just a little tidbit for FYI. All right, several miles and a few hours later, we're arriving at one of my favorite places to visit up here, which is the Lost Pond. Just a beautiful place to sit and relax you can swim you can fish 
anything you want to do here and it's just so beautiful and peaceful and here's a better view of the beautiful lost pond uh, again all part of the white mountain national forest this is just a beautiful location so serene tons of wildlife around here and very very special place to be just to sit and relax and of course we have behind it the beautiful white mountains those that's the presidential range right there so gonna hang out here for a little while and just relax yeah it was a wet but beautiful climb out here to get to the lost pond uh quite a bit of rain this morning so had to rock the rain gear for a little while but it's letting up might allow for some uh better trekking later on in the day but so far it's been awesome and just a thrill to be here in the great outdoors all along the way there's these beautiful brooks again beautiful fresh spring water that you could drink right out of the stream and there's actually some really beautiful trout in here as well uh, if you like eating trout so Okay, rain's starting to pick up a little bit, so I'm going to start hiking out from the Lost Pond, but it was worth every step. Uh, the soreness from yesterday's climb is definitely, you know, still with me, so uh, taking my time here today, but, uh, you know, this, uh, this trip out here was worth every minute because uh, it's just such a beautiful place to be, away from the things of man. Okay, that was a raven's nest I just showed you, and uh, I didn't want to disturb them. They were having a little uh, discussion, and all of that crowing that you hear, that's not just noise. They have a very sophisticated communication process. They're talking to each other and giving each other signals on where to go for food and different activities, so pretty cool stuff. And of course, you know, no trip would be complete without a visit to the local music store. So here we are at North Conway Music Center. It's a great little shop. Here's one of the very special landmarks in this area. This is the Mount Washington Hotel, uh, built in 1902. It's often compared to, and maybe even sometimes confused with, the Overlook Hotel from the famous movie, The Shining. You know, just because of its design and its proximity to the mountain range. Behind it is Mount Washington. And, uh, sorry for the road noise there. Uh, with the mountain is uh, kind of obscured by cloud cover, but right in the center there would be the peak. Uh, but on a clearer day, uh, this hotel provides just an unbelievable view of vistas of the mountain. Uh, I've been a, a guest in the hotel a couple of times. I didn't stay there this time, but I'm gonna take you inside for a little bit, just kind of show you around the lobby. Just another quick view of the front of the hotel. Okay, and here we are in a beautiful lobby of the Omni Mount Washington Hotel. As I said, this was built in 1902 and over the years, you know, it had maybe fallen into a little bit of disrepair, but the Omni Corporation bought the hotel some years ago and just really revitalized it. And uh, the rooms are very stately and beautiful. Uh, it's been the hotel for 
presidents and other very important dignitaries over the years. Here in the lobby, there's a Steinway from 1882, solid rosewood, just a beautiful piano. Unfortunately, it's locked up, so they're not gonna let me tickle the ivories on this, but fun to look at. And here's the view from the beautiful wraparound deck on the back of the hotel. Uh, I wish I could offer you a better view of the mountain, but it's, uh, as you can see, it's a very cloudy day, we're very fogged in, but uh, the peak would be right in the center of your screen there. And actually, uh, I'll try to zoom in and see if I can show you. In the center of your screen, you'll see a track that's cut out in the center there. That is the Cog Railway. So there's a train that goes to the summit of the mountain from this, this is the western facing part of the mountain. And that Cog Railway, uh, drives up on one cog. <laughs> uh, so you're sort of putting your life in your hands a little bit and riding it, but uh, it does uh, go all the way to the summit and you can go up there and come back down via train. And here's the view from the front deck of the hotel. So as you can see, just beauty all around, no matter what direction you look in. This is uh, at the bottom of your screen, that's the Mount Washington Hotel Golf Course. I've never played it, but it looks to be quite beautiful. And as you can see, just fantastic views. Uh, no matter what direction your room faces, for the most part, you're going to have some beautiful mountain views. So, quite a place to be. Hey everybody, I just wanted to take a few minutes to uh, demonstrate to you, you know, the gear and equipment and things, the supplies that I bring along for a trek up to the top of Mount Washington or really any significant, you know, uh, climb that you're considering doing. Uh, I'll use Mount Washington as an example because it's the tallest peak anywhere near where I live. And, uh, it's really a fun and exciting and challenging thing to do, but you know, it's, it's dangerous. It's, it's nothing to be uh, taken lightly. You know, an average of two people die each year on Mount Washington. That's no joke. Look it up. Uh, it's nothing to be fooled with. In fact, uh, about a year ago, uh, a man passed away from hypothermia in late July. So, you know, it's, uh, the weather can get really crazy and you can injure yourself and be stuck and, you know, there's all kinds of things that can happen. So I just, you know, if you're going to do it, let's do it right and do it, most importantly, do it safe. So uh, first thing I'll start with is you need a decent backpack and, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money, but you definitely want to get something that is weatherproof, waterproof, and, you know, has enough storage for the kinds of things that you're going to want to bring. Uh, hopefully it has some you know, quick grab access panel so you don't have to take it off each time you need something. But uh, just, you know, a, a decent quality backpack. And I recommend getting a bright colored one like this because, uh, you know, this isn't the army. You're not trying to blend in. Uh, you want people and things to see you, hopefully. So uh, a brighter color is uh, probably advisable, you know. So uh, next up, uh, first aid kit. So, you know, you don't have to, you know, have anything really elaborate, but it is important to have, you know, some bandages, some antiseptic wipes, things like that. Maybe some gauze in case you twist your ankle. Uh, you know, obviously you can't bring a lot of stuff with you for first aid. And if you really get hurt badly, you know, you're going to have to rely on your fellow hikers or, you know, passersby to kind of come to your aid. But uh, anyway, it's a good first aid kit. Got to have it, right? Very important. Uh, let's see. Rain gear. Very important. So the weather can change there. I've seen it go from 70 degrees and sunny at the base uh, to 20 degrees and snowing at the summit. So anything can happen. Anything and everything can happen. So you're definitely going to want to get some really light uh, rain gear. But it's an absolute must. Uh that you, you want to bring that along. Now, if the day of the climb you check and it looks like there's a 100% chance of sunshine and 
zero percent chance of rain. Okay, maybe you can leave this, you know, uh, out of the pack. But uh, if there's any chance at all that there's going to be some weather, you're going to want this uh, for sure. So uh, along those lines, extra dry clothes. Uh, and I always pack a change of clothes. Dry socks are very important. Uh, I've climbed it in torrential downpours all the way to the top from the base to the top. Uh, soaked like a rat by the time I got up there. And boy, was I glad I had a pair, of, a set of dry clothes to change into when I got there. So uh, you definitely want to want to bring that along. And with that in mind, you want to dress in layers. Uh, even when you leave, you know, chances are you're going to start out pretty early in the morning. It might be cool. Uh, so like a light fleece, things like that. Things that you can get out of quickly and still fit in your backpack are, are really good to have. But yeah, a set of dry clothes for a change at the summit is uh, something you'll be really glad you brought along. And if you buy the right stuff, it's nice and light. It doesn't add a lot of weight to your to your pack overall. Uh, I want to talk about shoes because <laughs> this is super, super important. Uh, you don't want to skimp on the footwear that you're going to wear. Uh, you don't want to wear sneakers. You know, uh, the rocks and things are, a lot of them are moss covered and so forth. And things like, you know, tennis shoes or sneakers are just not going to provide you with the grip power that you're going to need. Uh, now, there's a couple of, you know, different ways to approach it. If you know the weather is going to be really good, you can go for uh, this style of shoe, which doesn't have uh, the ankle, you know, support. Uh, but make sure that it has some really, really solid gripping. Uh, but I'll tell you this, your ankles are going to be tested like never before. You're going to be twisting and turning in all kinds of directions. And so uh, you might want to consider using a shoe that has at least some ankle support. And you can get ones that are even taller than this. Uh, but your ankles are really going to take a beating. Uh, so just have that in mind. And the other super important thing is whatever you do, don't buy shoes like the day before you're going to climb and not wear them. You need to wear these and break them in significantly before you climb. Because if you don't, chances are one little spot within the shoe is going to set up a blister. And man, there's nothing worse than trying to climb a mountain or climb down a mountain with a foot blister. Every step will be torture. So make sure that whatever shoes you wear, you break them in, you wear them in, you make sure they're absolutely comfortable before you uh, try an endeavor like this. I've seen it happen. I've taken friends along. They bought a brand new pair of really expensive, you know, hiking shoes the day before. And uh, there was one little spot in there that needed to be broken in and they didn't do that. And man, they were in agony. So please, you know, good quality footwear with good gripping power and break them in, wear them in. Uh, I guess the, the only thing left to talk about, oh, well, before I talk about food, trek poles, an absolute essential. Two, not one, not zero, two trek poles. Telescoping trek poles, these are absolutely essential for your balance. When you're climbing up these rock piles, uh, and you try to do it just using your arms as counterweights, man, you're, I mean, I'm not saying you can't do it, but you just made life so much harder and more dangerous than it needs to be. These trek poles are just invaluable in stabilizing your body while you make the steps that you need to make because every step is different. You're, you're just looking around for the path of least resistance from rock to rock. And, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, walking on a stair machine or climbing stairs or, you know, it's completely uneven the entire way. So these things are absolutely essential. Two of them, not one, not zero, two good quality trek poles. They telescope, you can put them in your backpack, get them, got to have them. All right, food and water. Uh, oh, sorry, I keep forgetting one more thing. Bug spray. You know, a decent, healthy, quality bug spray is advisable. If it's windy on the mountain, which it often is, the bugs won't bother you because they can't fly in the wind. They just keep getting blown away. But if it's a really still day, especially below the tree line, uh, you know, gnats and mosquitoes can, you know, 
drive you crazy. It's just one more aggravation you don't need, you know. So a good quality bug spray is is great for that. All right, finally, uh, sustenance, food, water. Uh, for food, um, what I usually do is I just pack, you know, some really, really good protein bars. Uh, you can choose the ones, you know, of your, of your choice. Uh, these are uh, the RX bars. They're made mostly of eggs and nuts, very little carbs, a lot of protein. Uh, but you're going to be burning so many calories that, you know, you can kind of live it up a little bit and get the kind that are maybe, you know, a little more sugary and have a lot of carbohydrates in them. It's okay because believe me, you're going to be burning more calories than you ever imagined when you when you try to do this. Uh, and then also, uh, I like to bring some fresh fruit. You know, the kinds of things that are going to replenish you, like bananas, uh, are great because you're you're going to be sweating so much. You're not even going to believe it. I don't care how cold it is or whatever you are gonna sweat like you've never sweated before because the workload on your body is extreme. So things that are gonna replenish your potassium, for example, you know, bananas, uh, any, any kind of fruit, pick the fruit of your choice, but bring along some fresh fruit. Don't be afraid of eating too much. Believe me, you're gonna burn it off. Not gonna be a problem. So, uh, and then, you know, there's uh, also, you know, nuts, bags of nuts or gray almonds, things like that. Anything with, you know, low volume, high protein that you can fit in your pack that's lightweight. You can bring sandwiches. You know, if you have the room in your uh, backpack, you're going to have time to stop and eat. You're going to want to stop and eat and rest. Uh, so bring along, you know, wraps or, you know, anything that's, you know, fairly lightweight and isn't going to spoil uh, in the heat necessarily. So uh, the last thing I'll talk about uh, is water. So as I mentioned before, you, you, the sweat load is, is just astronomical. You're going to sweat so much, you're not even going to believe it. You're going to be absolutely soaked. And I don't care how cold it is outside, uh, you're, you are going to sweat. And you're going to need a lot of water. Now, the thing about water is it's heavy. You know, it weighs 8.33 pounds per gallon. Uh, so, you know, that's going to weigh you down initially. You know, and how much water do you bring? There's a lot of different schools of thought. And what should it be transported in? Uh, I like to bring smaller bottles like this that I can stick in the side of my bag and access quickly. If you really want to go crazy, you can get a bladder with a hose. Uh, but those are kind of limited in size. They only The biggest one I've ever seen so far is I think like three liters. You're going to need more than that. Um, I try to bring a gallon of water starting out. And uh, well, that's roughly about four liters if you're thinking in metrics. But but you're going to go through it really quickly. And the more you drink, obviously, the less you're going to be carrying, right? Now, depending on the trail you take, there might be some opportunities to fill these up in brooks and streams. Uh, if you're nervous about drinking that kind of water, you can get the purifying tablets. But uh, I've often for many years drank water. As long as it's a, a rapid flow of water coming off the mountain, I just drink it. I've never had a problem. There's a couple stops along the way uh, on the trails that you take where you might have opportunities to uh, reload on, on water either through a pump system or just in the brook itself. But I like to bring a gallon of water. I think that's enough at least to get to the summit. At the summit, you can you know b purchase water or, or refill water and, and have that access uh, in case you're gonna climb back down. Uh, there's ways to get back down from Mount Washington without having to climb. There's van rides and things, but uh, if you're gonna climb back down, you're gonna need to reload on water because you're gonna go through so much water and you're gonna sweat like you wouldn't believe. So uh, be prepared for this. So that's pretty much it. I hope this information is helpful for you. If you're thinking about climbing Mount Washington and you wanna know a little bit more about it, uh, or if you've done it and you have some better advice than mine, great. Uh, leave a comment or my email address is in the description. Send me a message. I'll tell you what I know. There's people that know way more than I do. And then there's people that were like myself that were doing it for the first time. And we're relying on, you know, videos like this to help instruct on what to do. So I've done a lot of things wrong. I've done a lot of things right. But uh, this is the information that I know best right now. So I hope this was helpful to you. And uh, 
If you do it, I hope you have a great time and I hope you stay very, very safe. All right, we're back on the lower levels of Mount Georgia. And I just want to thank you for coming along with me on my little journey. I hope you found it interesting and maybe informative if it's something you're thinking about doing, if you're in the area uh, or just want to learn more about it. Uh, just, you know, shoot me an email. Uh, my email's in the description below. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, or if you want to just share your experiences, you know, in the comments section or what have you, that would be awesome too. So uh, yeah, it's uh, really a, a really fun and amazing place to be. And I just wanted to share it with you, take it kind of outside the guitar world for a little bit. Uh, but I will be back with some more guitar reviews coming up really soon. And uh, I guess until then, great to be with you. And thank you so much for being a part of the channel. And I look forward to seeing you soon. So bye-bye.